This is a simple introduction to glaciers as natural systems. Before we begin, let's have a look at three definitions. Ice sheets are large areas of ice, um, at least 50,000 kilometers square. They can be 2,000 meters thick, mostly found in polar regions. Ice caps are the same sort of thing, just a bit smaller. They're under 50,000 kilometers square. Glaciers are different. They are rivers of ice that flow down valleys, um, moving downhill because of gravity. Now, all of these form in areas where it's cold enough for precipitation to fall as snow. Snowflakes land on the ground as 80 to 95% air. They then melt, evaporate, and are compacted into neve, which is 40 to 50% air. Over time, it compacts more to become fern, which is 20 to 30% air content. And then finally, after decades, um, it's compacted into glacier ice, which contains 10 to 20% air. Now, here is an example of an ice cap. Um, this is the Vatna Yukul. Um, I apologize about the pronunciation. This is an ice cap um, within Iceland. Now, if we zoom in, um, we can see here's the ice cap and out of the edge of the ice cap, there are glaciers, these rivers of ice moving out of the ice cap because, because of gravity and heading downwards and towards the sea. Um, here's a close up view of the eastern side. You can see each of these is an individual glacier. And then finally, this is what the glacier looks like as it heads down out of the ice cap and towards the sea. Glaciers as natural systems. Now this is oversimplified for A level, it really is. Um, but a system is something that has inputs, things coming into it, flows and transfers or processes going on within the system and outputs, things that are coming out of the system. Here's a really simple example. A toaster would have electricity and bread going into it, for example, as inputs. Um, the flows or transfers will be the heating and the cooking going on within the system. And then the output is the toast um, and could even be the smell um, of the toast. Um, if we have a look at a tropical rainforest, um, the input to things like sunshine and precipitation. Um, flows and transfers would be things like the water cycle or the nutrient cycle. And the outputs would be the scenery, the tall trees, the vegetation, oxygen coming out of the system and sounds coming out of the system. Without further ado, let's have a look at glaciers as systems. So in this picture, we can see the ice cap or the ice sheet and then the glacier is the river of ice coming out to it. And the name we give to the end of the glacier where it ends is the snout. Now, further up the glacier, it is going to be colder because every 100 meters we go up in height, it gets one degree centigrade colder. So where it is colder, there's going to be more snow falling than melting occurring. And so overall we're accumulating snow and ice, it's called the accumulation zone. As the glacier moves downhill, we get to the area where it's warmer. And as a result, there might be more melting going on than snow and ice being laid down. This is called ablation, it's the ablation zone. So somewhere within the glacier, we have an equilibrium line. And along the equilibrium line, there are equal amounts of snow accumulation and ablation or melting um, going onwards. So here's a simple diagram showing different parts of the glacier. Now let's have a look at the glacier as a system. It's an open system and this means it's got inputs from and outputs to other systems. The main inputs will be snow and also snow and ice falling down from the mountain sides through avalanches. The main outputs from our glacier um, will be evaporation, sublimation, which is where ice turns directly to water vapour without the water stage in the middle, and water from melting ice close to the glacier snout. Let's have a look at energy within our glacier. 
The force of gravity combines with the glacier's mass to generate potential energy. And then as the glacier moves and because of meltwater, this potential energy is converted into kinetic energy, enabling the glacier to do the work of erosion, transportation and deposition. Stores and components, the main store is snow and ice, but the amount varies. Um, in temperate regions, obviously, you get different seasons um, and generally across the world, because of global warming, it's felt that the amount of snow and ice stored in glaciers is decreasing um, because of global warming. In terms of flows and transfers, you have evaporation, sublimation, meltwater flow, glacial movement, and the glaciers are most active in warmer areas with significant seasonal variations. And then you get a large amount of melting or in the winter, a large amount of snow and ice accumulation. Let's have a look next at positive and negative feedback loops. The positive feedbacks speed up the processes that promote rapid change. And here's an example. Um, if the land is exposed, darker surfaces will reflect less sunlight. Therefore, more solar radiation is absorbed. The ground becomes warmer. This leads to the Arctic ice melting, the land being exposed, and then the cycle is repeated, making even more ice melt. So that's a positive feedback loop because it's promoting the rapid melting of the glacier. Meanwhile, a negative feedback loop is something that will slow down changes in the glacier, um, establishing balance. Finally, let's have a look at the phrase dynamic equilibrium. Um, this is where there's a balance between the accumulation and ablation, ablation. So along the equilibrium line, there's exactly the same amounts of accumulation and ablation. Now this equilibrium is called dynamic because it changes. Um, if it gets colder, there will be more snow and ice fall towards the top of the glacier, and then the equilibrium line will move downwards towards where the snout is at the moment. If the climate gets warmer and there's more melting going on, then the equilibrium line will move upwards further towards where the top of the glacier is at the moment. So it's called a dynamic equilibrium. Finally, let's just have a quick look at landforms and landscapes. In glacial areas, you get a variety of different landforms. Um, a landform is a recognisable feature that we can see as part of the terrain and the landscape is all of the visible features on the Earth's surface in an area of land. So if we're looking at and describing a glacial landscape, um, this is the sort of thing that we would see. And we would see glaciers, snowfields, steep mountainsides and deep valleys and all the landforms um, of glaciation that we'll come on to in another video. Um, in places, the mountainsides are strewn with rocks, dumped by melting ice or piled up beneath frost shattered cliffs exposed rock surfaces with evidence of glacial erosion and um, deep scratches or polished surfaces and it's possible to infer the area that we can see would be popular with climbers and walkers so there is a typical glaciated landscape <laughs>